We have one remaining Liberty individual, and he's not going to let her leave the aircraft at this time. He made me feel very sure that uh, we had a very real and horrifying threat. We don't know who he was, where he came from, or where he went. Hi folks, it's Ryan Burns, and today I wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive into Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. McCoy is arguably the most well-known Cooper suspect out there, despite being eliminated as a suspect by the FBI in 1972. Despite that elimination, he remains an ever-present force in the Cooper case. This enduring interest in McCoy is certainly understandable, with most all Cooper-related media continuing to give him publicity. Also, he is the only Cooper suspect who actually pulled this off, so he does get some credit for that. I think the real root of McCoy's popularity among the public as a Cooper suspect is due in large part to his appearance in that Unsolved Mysteries episode. Hearing that creepy music alongside a visual of his face and the Cooper sketch certainly made everyone watching go, hmm. These days, discussions about McCoy are pretty much the sole domain of amateur sleuths arguing back and forth on the internet. But back in 1972, there was the very real belief within the Bureau that the two hijackers were in fact the same individual. Many agents assumed that McCoy's hijacking was just Cooper refining his methods and striking again to extort even more money. This assumption led to a frantic yet ultimately short-lived investigation to try and connect McCoy to Cooper. So what was it about McCoy that caused the FBI to investigate him so thoroughly as a Cooper suspect and then to drop him so quickly as a Cooper suspect? Before I go into all the arguments about why he was or wasn't Cooper, I think it's important that we start back at the beginning and talk about his own hijacking a little bit. It's April 7, 1972, and around 3 p.m., McCoy hijacks United Airlines Flight 855 not long after it departed Denver on its way to Los Angeles. McCoy demanded that the plane fly to San Francisco and that upon arrival at the airport, he wanted $500,000 in four parachutes. United Airlines, as typical of the airline companies during that era, complied fully with these demands. Upon receipt of his ransom, McCoy ordered that the luggage be unloaded onto the tarmac and then commanded two passengers to go locate his suitcase and bring it aboard. Inside his bulky suitcase was McCoy's personal parachute, a jumpsuit, helmet, flares, and about 100 feet of rope. He had also packed a large duffel bag that could be clipped onto a parachute harness, and it was into this bag that he dumped his cash. Once all of his ransom demands were satisfied, he let the passengers go and he decided to keep two stewardesses and the three flight crew members on board. He then passed a note up to the pilot that detailed a precise flight path, the exact speed, and the altitude that he wanted the plane to fly at. These instructions that he gave to the pilot would force the aircraft toward Provo, Utah, where McCoy was living with his wife and two small children while he was also attending Brigham Young University. Around 11.12 p.m., as the lumbering 727 was over Springville, Utah, which is a community outside of Provo, McCoy jumped from the rear stairs at about 14,000 feet. He landed pretty hard in the middle of a cow pasture, but was otherwise uninjured. Looking around, he saw that there was a diner that was open in the distance, so he started to walk toward that diner, but he certainly didn't want to walk into town looking like somebody who had just parajacked a jet for $500,000, so McCoy decided to stash the ransom money and his parachute inside of a culvert that ran underneath a road. Although it was nearly midnight by the time McCoy made it to the diner, he was still able to order a chocolate malt, which he ended up paying for with one of the twin R bills from his ransom. Despite still wearing his jumpsuit, he was able to convince a local teenager, 16-year-old Pete Zimmerman, to give him a ride back into Provo. McCoy was dropped off a few blocks from his home by Zimmerman, and actually ended up sleeping in his own bed that night, but not before returning to his stash spot around 3 a.m. to pick up his money and his parachutes. Though McCoy would be the only airline extortionist who is known to have made it home with his ransom, his success was short-lived. The seeds of his demise had been planted just a few hours earlier, one of McCoy's best friends, Bob Van Iperen, called the McCoy residence around 11.30 p.m. to tell Richard the exciting news about the skyjacking that was happening in their own backyard. As a highway patrol dispatcher, Van Iperen was always privy to the latest scoop before anyone else knew of it and was particularly eager to relay this story to his best friend. Van Iperen and McCoy had actually flown helicopters together for the Utah National Guard and had traded brags back and forth about how they would accomplish their own D.B. Cooper hijacking. Unfortunately for McCoy, his sister-in-law, Denise, answered the phone when Van Iperen called. Although she was not an active accomplice like her sister, Karen, who drove her husband to the airport that morning, Denise did know that a hijacking was being planned. She just didn't know when it was going to take place. So when Denise answered Van Iperen's call, she told him that neither Richard nor Karen were home. In fact, they had been gone all day. 
By 9 a.m. the next morning, Van Iperen was on the phone with the FBI in Salt Lake City, having concluded overnight that the hijacker was likely his best friend Richard. Agents then spent the next several hours attempting to locate McCoy until finally realizing where he was. He was flying a National Guard helicopter assisting in the search for the missing hijacker. So, in an insanely ironic twist, McCoy spent the day after his $500,000 hijacking looking for himself. But as McCoy circled his helicopter over north-central Utah, the FBI were busy showing his photo to passengers and crew and also comparing his prints to those found on the aircraft. The positive photo IDs and the matching prints were enough to secure a search warrant for McCoy's property and also to obtain an arrest warrant for the man himself. Not long after sunrise on April 9th, two days after the hijacking, McCoy was sitting on the floor of his living room in handcuffs, watching his agents swarm through his modest home. Without much effort, the FBI easily located the money. It had been stuffed inside of a cardboard box and then shoved into one of McCoy's closets. McCoy would only make one comment to the media as he was being perp-walked. He told them, It's embarrassing. Let's face it. Despite his guilt being all but confirmed by the recovery of the ransom in his own home, a trial still took place in June 1972. The jury needed only 90 minutes of deliberation to convict McCoy, and he was subsequently sentenced to 45 years in prison. Dwelling over the fact that he would probably never see his children again, or would at least see them when he was an old man, he became despondent in prison. This despair led him to take part in a pretty dramatic escape along with a fellow inmate in 1974. His freedom would only last about three months before he was killed in a shootout with FBI agents in Virginia Beach on November 9, 1974. I think the most tragic thing about the McCoy hijacking and about his subsequent conviction and escape and being killed is that it really wasn't necessary. If you look at most of the other Cooper copycats who were Vietnam veterans like McCoy who were clearly suffering PTSD like Rob Hetty and Richard LaPointe, they were all released within 10 years of their convictions. And there's really no reason to think that McCoy, a decorated Vietnam veteran himself, wouldn't have been afforded that same treatment. And I think it's quite possible that McCoy would still be alive today. As of the time of this recording, he would only be 81 right now. So all that said, was McCoy Cooper? No, I'm here to tell you that he was not Cooper, and I'm about to give you all the reasons why. First, let's start by comparing the two physically. If you compare McCoy's mugshot to the most famous Cooper sketch, there is some resemblance insofar as the head shape goes and the hairline. McCoy was also 5'10", so he was roughly the same height as Cooper, but that's about where the similarities end. For the FBI, any real possibility that McCoy and Cooper were the same individual came to a crashing halt when, on April 12th, McCoy's photos were shown to Tina Mucklow, Alice Hancock, and Florence Schaffner, the three stewardesses from D.B. Cooper's hijacking. The three stewardesses were shown color photos of McCoy standing, of his side profile, and several other headshots. All three concurred that McCoy was not the man who hijacked their flight five months earlier. In fact, they were even able to point out specific differences between the two men. They noted that Cooper had fuller hair than McCoy's thin comb-over. It was also pointed out that Cooper's nose wasn't as wide as McCoy's nose was. And finally, Florence Schaffner noted that McCoy had blue eyes, whereas the eyes that she had stared into on that November afternoon were definitely brown, according to her. And also, Bill Mitchell, who sat across from D.B. Cooper, was shown multiple photographs of McCoy by the FBI, and he stated that McCoy was definitely not D.B. Cooper. Five other witnesses were shown photographs of McCoy by the FBI, and while a few of them did say there were some similarities as far as the hairline went and the face shape, all of them agreed that McCoy was definitely not D.B. Cooper. By contrast, the eyewitnesses in McCoy's hijacking had no problem at all identifying his face out of a photo lineup. These positive identifications were made in spite of the fact that McCoy had worn a disguise. Yet Cooper was not believed to be wearing a wig, nor was he noted as wearing any makeup. So let's just say that McCoy was Cooper. Is it really possible that McCoy could be so easily identified by those who saw him in a wig and makeup, yet somehow not be identified by those who saw him without a disguise? That just seems a little far-fetched to me. Also, the stewardesses on Flight 305 confirmed that Cooper had no scars or noticeable marks, yet McCoy had a pretty noticeable scar on his left cheek from a mole that had been removed. This scar was conspicuous enough that McCoy actually wore a Band-Aid over it during his hijacking. Their voices were also described differently. Tina Mucklow claimed that Cooper's voice was low and that she was unable to detect any accent, leading her to assume that he was from the Midwest or a Western state. And also, the ticket agent who sold Cooper his ticket stated that Cooper had a pleasant voice, whatever that means. Yet McCoy had a birth defect which left him with a very noticeable lisp. He was also a Southerner, so he had a Southern accent. Yet in contrast to Cooper's low and soft voice without any accent, 
McCoy's voice was described by the crew of his hijacked flight as high-pitched and sounding like he was rolling his tongue over certain words. In fact, McCoy's voice sounded so odd to the crew that the second officer of the plane told the FBI that he thought that McCoy was doing a fake accent, like he was disguising his voice somehow, but that was just actually his voice. Another difference between the two hijackers that is brought up quite often is that Cooper appeared to be a heavy smoker of Raleigh filter tip cigarettes. McCoy was never noted by anyone to have ever smoked. There are some McCoy enthusiasts who will claim that McCoy was simply fake smoking to throw off the FBI. But if that's true, then why did he smoke during the Northwest Orient hijacking, but not during his United Airlines hijacking? In fact, far from being a cigarette smoker, McCoy was actually observed on the plane chowing down on candy that he had brought aboard. The age discrepancy is also pretty significant between McCoy and Cooper, with most Cooper eyewitnesses describing him as mid-40s. Uh, some even say into his 50s, yet McCoy was not even 30 when he did his hijacking. Many McCoy enthusiasts will write off this age discrepancy by arguing to just look at the videos and footage of McCoy from that time period. And while I'll admit that he does look older than 29 years old, it's important to understand that estimating age is often relative to the time period. While he might look like a 40-year-old man to us as we look back on this old film footage, the passengers and crew of Flight 855 who interacted with McCoy both before and after he put on his disguise described him as mid to late 20s. Stewardess Diane Sundam, who played the same role with McCoy as Mucklow had played with Cooper, she believed that he was about 27 years old. So is it really likely that the McCoy eyewitnesses could nail his age so accurately, yet the Cooper eyewitnesses were off so badly when they're dealing with the exact same individual? The physical similarities between the two hijackers really aren't as close as some people might think. For those who may think that McCoy was Cooper, it's just really hard to get around the fact that McCoy was instantly recognized and picked out of photo lineups by his victims, yet every single last one of the Cooper eyewitnesses stated that McCoy was not their hijacker. But aside from their obvious physical dissimilarities, what else makes McCoy not Cooper? Let's look at the method of the hijacking next. Although the McCoy hijacking is often believed to be very similar to Cooper's in method, when you look at the FBI's investigative files of both hijackings, they show that there were actually a lot more differences than similarities. Chief among these differences was the parachuting acumen of both subjects. Cooper asked for generic parachutes and didn't really care where they came from. Yet in McCoy's demand note, he specified that he wanted four Commander brand parachutes and that they were to come from Perry Stevens' equipment company in Oakland, California. And when McCoy made his jump, he was wearing a helmet, jumpsuit, and jump boots that he had smuggled aboard. Whereas when Cooper was last seen by Tina Mucklow, he had his parachute strapped on over his suit, indicating that this was probably how he was attired when he jumped. Despite demanding these four commander parachutes, McCoy had actually smuggled his own parachute onto the plane with his luggage, whereas Cooper was totally reliant on the parachutes he was provided. Given how attached skydivers are with their own personal parachute rigs, the FBI determined that Cooper's reliance on unknown parachutes was highly suggestive that he was not a recreational skydiver. Aside from Cooper, five other hijackers leapt from jets with ransoms. Only two of these parajackers were actually trained skydivers, that being McCoy and Rob Hetty, and they were the only two to bring their own parachutes. This is a fact that pretty much supports the FBI's belief that skydivers would attempt to jump with their own rigs. So with McCoy being very thorough with his parachutes and Cooper being like, whatever, man, this is pretty highly suggestive that they were different individuals. Stark differences between the two hijackings are also evident as far as the weapons go. Cooper's only threat was the briefcase bomb, and although McCoy claimed in his ransom note that he had explosives, he was visibly brandishing a 45 pistol and a grenade. If McCoy had committed the Cooper hijacking and the briefcase bomb had already proved sufficient, what would be the benefit of adding a pistol and a grenade to the threat? Also, it could be argued that displaying these weapons actually hindered McCoy's hijacking by eliminating any possibility of keeping the passengers unaware. Cooper also exhibited more thoughtfulness than McCoy did with regard to the evidence that they left behind. Complete fingerprints were lifted from McCoy's seat, his boarding pass, and from a magazine found in the pocket of his seat. Prints were also developed from two items that he brought onto the plane but forgot to retrieve. McCoy also failed to realize that one of his handwritten notes had been pocketed by a stewardess. Another major knock against McCoy is just how different the personalities of the two hijackers are. A central component of the mystique surrounding Cooper has always been his coolness under pressure. When thinking of Cooper, one often envisions a James Bond-like figure wearing sunglasses and sipping a cocktail with the attractive blonde lighting his cigarettes. 
But despite this cool demeanor, Cooper was undoubtedly nervous, but he was just able to hide it well. McCoy, on the other hand, was pretty visibly upset and anxious throughout much of the hijacking. As McCoy boarded the plane, his mounting anxiety caused him to leave the manila envelope containing his demand notes inside the terminal where he had been sitting. Once McCoy and the other passengers were comfortably seated inside the plane, a gate agent boarded the aircraft, raising the envelope high, asking if anybody had left it inside the terminal. A panicked McCoy quickly jumped up and snatched it away. As far as disguises go, if Cooper wore a disguise of some sort, then he was already wearing it as he bought his ticket and then boarded the plane. Yet McCoy caused a noticeable scene when he went to the laboratory to change into his disguise. Applying the makeup and adjusting the wig to cover his ears must have taken longer than expected because the plane began taxiing while he was still in the laboratory. A stewardess knocked on the door, politely reminding him that they were due to take off and that he should return to his seat. McCoy ignored her, and eventually someone pounded on the door and commanded, Get out of there at once! We are ready for takeoff! It was the voice of the second officer who had been sent back there to deal with the situation. McCoy had entered this lavatory as a white man with thinning hair wearing a brown business suit. The man who emerged from the lavatory under the suspicious gaze of the second officer and the stares of several passengers had dark skin and long bushy hair. And he was wearing blue bell-bottom slacks, blue shoes, a cream-colored shirt with a pattern of loud green flowers, and a red striped sports jacket. To top it off, he was wearing mirrored sunglasses. This amazing transformation and his outlandish appearance had begun to draw quick glances from several passengers. Two passengers even believed they saw a pistol in his possession, and they went forward to report their concern to a stewardess. Not long afterward, another passenger hurried to the front to report the sighting of a grenade. All of this was enough for the captain to realize that a hijacking was imminent. He even called ahead to Grand Junction, Colorado, and told them to prepare for an emergency landing that he had a hijacking situation. This is all before the hijacking even began. Now compare all of this bizarre antics to Cooper, who was so calm that he was able to keep the passengers completely unaware that they were even being hijacked. Totally generic looking and blandly dressed, Cooper began his hijacking by discreetly passing a note to the stewardess, allowing him to avoid detection from the passengers completely. So now that we've talked about how different McCoy and Cooper were physically and how dissimilar their hijackings were, let's look into the FBI's investigation to try and connect the two. Determining McCoy's whereabouts on November 24, 1971 was the obvious first step for the investigation. When McCoy's wife Karen was asked about it, she told agents that her husband would have likely attended his regular morning classes at BYU that morning, leaving the house around 7.30 a.m. as was his usual routine during that fall semester. Agents attempted to verify Karen's statement but ran into a roadblock when they discovered that neither of his scheduled classes had taken role that day. However, his attendance in class was verified for the previous day, November 23rd. It was also discovered that he had written a check on campus that day as well. When she was asked about her husband's whereabouts on November 25th, Thanksgiving Day, Karen stated that McCoy had helped prepare a Thanksgiving dinner that morning and that the family ate around 2 p.m. Her statement would later be verified by a BYU student from Thailand who was invited over for Thanksgiving dinner by McCoy. He told the FBI that he got to the McCoy residence around 10 a.m. on that Thanksgiving day and that McCoy was there preparing the food. Following that Thanksgiving lunch, McCoy and his wife took a trip to Las Vegas, leaving their children with Karen's sister, Denise. This trip was confirmed through the record of a collect call that was made from the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas to the McCoy residence on that Thanksgiving night. Further confirmation of his presence in Las Vegas at that time was the discovery of a credit card receipt from a Las Vegas gas station signed by McCoy. Despite the physical evidence and the eyewitness testimony confirming his whereabouts on November 23rd and on the 25th, Karen's claim that McCoy was home on the 24th could never be independently confirmed by the FBI. Another avenue of investigation that the FBI undertook was to compare McCoy's hair to the hair found on Cooper's headrest. This test was conducted by the FBI's crime lab in April 1972, and it was no match. Questions were also raised within the FBI regarding McCoy's knowledge of the Cooper case. How was it that McCoy knew so much about Cooper's heist to emulate it so successfully? The answer soon became apparent when case agents discovered numerous paper clippings and documents pertaining to Cooper's hijacking within the McCoy house. As it turned out, McCoy knew so much about Cooper not because he was Cooper, but because he had written a research paper on skyjackings during that spring semester. McCoy's original intent with the paper, written for one of his criminal justice classes at BYU, was to illustrate how law enforcement could prevent a Cooper-style hijacking. And as he worked on the paper, he realized that there actually was no effective way to prevent this, so he decided to have a go at it himself. All of these factors that we've discussed were considered by case agents in Seattle. 
Their investigation into McCoy as Cooper was pretty intense and thorough, but quickly burned out, with the bulk of their effort occurring within the month of April 1972. The obvious disparities between the two hijackers with regard to age, method, and behavior served as pretty strong circumstantial evidence that they were not the same individual. The proverbial nail in the coffin for the investigation was supplied by the stewardesses of Flight 305. With none of the three stewardesses being able to identify McCoy as their hijacker, there's no way any effective prosecution could have ever taken place. Ultimately, McCoy was never prosecuted for hijacking Flight 305 because it was not a crime he committed, regardless of how desperately the FBI wanted him to be Cooper. But he just wasn't the hijacker. I think the FBI's position on whether McCoy was Cooper or Cooper was McCoy is summed up pretty neatly in this statement by Robin Montgomery, who was the former special agent in charge of the Portland office. And I can tell you from 20 plus years in the FBI that if, in fact, we could have made McCoy as D.B. Cooper, we would have done it. End of story. As for me, I, I certainly understand the appeal of making McCoy Cooper. I mean, there's some similarities and, you know, he actually did it. But I think that a lot of this comes from people not understanding that other people did this too. A lot of people don't understand that the copycats were a thing. There were five other guys who jumped out of planes with money, not just D.B. Cooper. I think if more people knew that, then they would know that McCoy doesn't have to be Cooper to have done it himself. He just has to be a copycat. And in so many ways, I kind of find it unfortunate that so many people try to uh, connect McCoy to Cooper as if McCoy's hijacking is not fascinating in his own right. McCoy doesn't have to be Cooper to be fascinating. He is an interesting person. He escaped from prison. He was a decorated helicopter pilot in Vietnam. He was a Green Beret. He was an overall fascinating guy. And it's just tragic the way his life ended. But the guy doesn't have to be D.B. Cooper. He can just be Richard McCoy. And that can and should be enough.